World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. My name is Alexander Kuzmanovic from the Department of Communications. And today on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, we will be talking about science and COVID-19. Therefore, it's my great pleasure to introduce our chief scientist, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having time and taking time to, to talk to our social media viewers and audience what is WHO doing on science and COVID-19. But first, would you like to explain to our viewers what is your role as a, as a chief scientist in WHO? Thank you and, and good morning, good evening to all the viewers. As you know, the science division was created um, last year, so the position of chief scientist is a new one. Now, WHO, since its um, creation, uh, is a science-based organization. It does normative work, which means that we develop guidelines and standards related to health for people around the world. And therefore, it's very important that this be all brought together within a science division. So basically, what we do is, first of all, make sure that there's quality assurance around all of the, uh, the standard setting, the normative work of the organization, which means that all the products that the different technical departments are doing are done in a standardized way, the way we collect data, the way we review it, the way we discuss with the experts and with a broader group of uh, people, including the public, how do we do consultation? And then how do we put it together to make those recommendations? So there has to be a standard across the organization that we will en enforce. And the second big uh, area is, uh, is a sort of a foresight function, is to be able to look ahead because science is moving very rapidly. There are so many advances that are in the early stages in the laboratories today, in, in people's ideas and minds, that 10 years from now will impact us in a big way. So today, if we see that artificial intelligence is impacting all aspects of our life, 10 years ago, we should have started thinking about this and saying, how do we prepare health systems for what will happen when artificial intelligence becomes a reality? Similarly, in genomics, there are many areas where there are such rapid advances that there will be diseases that can be cured and so on. So WHO needs to be ahead of the curve. And so that's the other major function of uh, the science division. And so it's, it's, it's a very exciting area to be in, but it also requires a lot of discipline and rigor and, and, and really applying a critical lens to everything that uh, we are doing. Thank you, Dr. Sumia. We are also fighting COVID-19 pandemic with science. What do we mean when we say that? So what we mean is that when you're faced with something completely new, this virus we only heard of in the beginning of January. So it's a big unknown, a big question mark. You know, where did it come from? What does it do? What effect does it have on people's bodies? What is it clinically? How does it spread? How can we control it? What, are, what drugs do we know that work? And of course, then how do we ultimately control it uh, uh, in the long term, say through a vaccine? So all of these are unknowns. And that is why we say that science has to bring the solutions because you need to gather the evidence. You need to do the research. You need to, for everyone to work together to come to an agreement on, on some of these questions. And so really, and science has moved so rapidly so much we can't believe it's only less than six months since we heard about this virus but we know a lot and it's mainly through the work of thousands of of scientists when i say scientists it also means uh, social scientists behavioral scientists scientists uh, um, not just the ones who are in the lab doing the work but really in those that uh, that are in the broader area of understanding uh, biology and 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 natural sciences Thank you, Dr. Sumia. Would you explain a little bit more how do we engage and how do we work with the science scientific community during, during the pandemic? So the way WHO works in general is through our wider community of experts across the world. And as I said, these span from basic scientists who work on, on genetics to, uh, to people who do clinical work, to people who do public health work, to people who do work in ethics and social sciences. So the way we operate is through expert groups and strategic advisory committees and groups. So depending on the area of work and the topic, you put together a, a group of experts. And this is now done through putting out a call uh, for experts from around the world to apply. And then there's a process 
of uh, criteria that we have to, to shortlist people. We also have strict conflict of interest policies so that if you are a person who is working in a particular topic and you have been funded in that area, you have to declare that you have received funding for that area of work and from whom have you received funding. Uh, and then there is a committee that looks to see if uh, that is fine for you to come and still be part of this committee and then you declare your conflicts of interest. So we have hundreds of these expert groups that advise us and the secretariat, there are experts within WHO of course in all these technical areas, but they don't make the final decisions. The decisions are made through these expert committees who look at all the evidence, who study it and then who advise. A good example I can give you is, is the SAGE, uh, the strategic, strategic advisory group uh, on immunizations and they actually are the ones who make immunization policy for the whole world and everyone, all countries follow that and, and many of the agencies like Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, they base their procurement of vaccines on the recommendations of SAGE. So that's just one example but we have many committees like that that actually develop uh, these guidelines. Thank you, Dr. Sumia. I would just like to use the opportunity to invite our viewers to ask uh, questions about science and COVID-19 on Facebook and LinkedIn through a uh, comment section. And if you're watching us on Twitter, please use the hashtag AskWHO. Um, you mentioned immunization and in February, WHO gathered hundreds of scientists around the world to discuss a research and development plan for a vaccine against COVID-19. So what was the plan they agreed on? So in February, uh, we, we had something called the Research and Innovation Forum for COVID. And this was, again, a few weeks after we heard about uh, this virus. So what we did was bring together over 400 people from around the world, again, scientists, experts, clinical, from all areas, but related to research on this virus. Many people connected virtually because they couldn't come physically to Geneva. And we, we developed nine working groups. So one of them was on vaccines, but there were nine working groups looking at all of these different uh, aspects of this virus and the disease that I mentioned. And each one of them actually produced a document on what do we know about this area? And of course, there was less known and much more that was unknown. What are the important questions that we need to answer in order to, uh, for us to control this? And they developed a roadmap. So we developed a research roadmap that covered nine different areas related to the virus. And uh, so these working groups that were developed in January and worked through the February forum and till now have all made progress. So what we're doing is at the end of this month on June 29th and 30th, we reconvene this probably more scientists now, not 400, but maybe 1000 people to discuss what have we learned in the last four months? What are the big knowledge gaps that we now have much more information on what are the remaining big topics that we need to work towards. So we hope that we take stock and then we look forward again to the next six months on what are the uh, priorities we need to work on. Now specifically on the vaccines, I think everybody is interested in knowing about vaccines. What we did at that time, early January, February was, okay, we're going to, scientists are going to be coming up with vaccine candidates. What is it going to take, you know, for something in a lab? to actually get to becoming an injection that people can receive. And there are many steps, many, many steps. It's not easy. You know, vaccine development normally takes 10 to 20 years. So here we're talking about developing a vaccine in 12 to 18 months. But we have to be sure each step of the way that we establish that this vaccine actually works, which uh, we call it efficacy, which means that it protects against infection and safety. These are the two properties of the vaccine. It should be safe in the sense you do not want a vaccine to cause more problems than what it's supposed to protect against. And, and so you have to go through these different phases of testing, starting from the uh, laboratory, uh, from cell cultures. Then you go into animals, mice, and, and some larger animals like monkeys. Then you go into uh, humans in a small number of people, what we call a phase one trial, where about 20 or 30 people or 50 at the most are given this injection. Sometimes different doses are tried and you look at them very carefully over the first few weeks to see what happens, both in terms of an immune response, because you want a good immune response to the virus, but also any side effects. Then you go to a phase two, which is usually several hundred people. 
Again, you're looking at the immune response, you're looking at safety, you start looking a little bit at efficacy, and then you do a phase three trial, which is usually thousands and thousands of people, where you have two groups. One group gets the vaccine, the other group gets usually some other uh, uh, vaccine as a, as a standard or a placebo injection, and then you wait and watch over a few months for people to develop uh, COVID through natural exposure. And then you see how many people developed in the vaccine group, how many developed it in the, in the placebo or the standard group, and also you are looking at side effects. Then you come to a conclusion on whether the vaccine is having protection and also safe, efficacious and safe. Uh, and then there are criteria by which you judge that. Um, and that's where policy bodies like the SAGE on immunization will come in because they will then look at all of this information and say, yes, this vaccine passes the test and can be recommended. And sometimes there are uh, caveats. You cannot give some vaccine to elderly because it doesn't have a good response. Some vaccines cannot or should not be used in children till they are properly tested in children. So they may, pregnancy is another one where we have to be very ca uh, careful and um, make sure the vaccine doesn't cause uh, damage to the fetus. So these are all the different aspects which need to be looked at. And so, as I said, normally this takes minimum of, you know, a few years, four or five years. But because we're in the middle of a pandemic, we are trying to compress this timeline, but at the same time, not compromising on any of the uh, scientific principles that I mentioned. Thank you very much, Dr. Sumia. And a lot of our viewers are already asking, even though you explained the whole process uh, that we need to go through to develop a safe uh, and effective vaccine, um, they are still asking when can we expect a vaccine against COVID. And at the moment, we have over 200,000 mm -hmm. uh, candidate vaccines, right? 200. 200. So uh, do, we, do we know um, if any of these is, is in advanced process at the moment? Of, of a trial? Yes, and it's true. Everyone is waiting for a vaccine because it's clear that uh, a vaccine would be the best way out of this pandemic. If you can vaccinate enough people, let's say 50, 60% of people become immune, the virus can stop spreading from one person to another. Now you can get immunity through natural infection, but we've seen now in many countries where there's been uh, a lot of infection that even at the end of a big outbreak, you have only five to 10% of the population with antibodies. So it's clear now that through natural infection, it's going to take a very, very long time to get natural herd immunity. So we need a vaccine. Now, how, what's the soonest we can get? As I said, we're hoping through doing everything uh, in parallel, instead of doing one step after another, which is a normal process of vaccine development, we try to do overlapping. You're already planning the manufacturing while you're still doing the clinical testing. You know, you're overlapping phase one and two, phase two and three. But the minimum it takes about 12 months, 12 to 18 months. The good thing is that some groups started working in January as soon as the genetic sequence of this virus became public. And so in March, we actually had the first vaccine candidate being tested in human beings, the phase one test. Now there are two vaccines that are currently in the later stages of testing, phase two, phase three. So we are expecting some results by October, November, December of this, of this year. Now, we cannot predict at this stage if either of those two vaccines is going to meet those standards that I talked about. But if, if we're hopeful and optimistic, yes, we could have the results at the end of the year, and we could also have some doses available. Now, how many million doses are going to be available? we again we cannot say but the good thing is that we have another eight or ten candidates which are getting into human trials and again which will be in large scale human trials by the end of this year so we're going to have 10 12 candidates entering or completing some part of human trials and therefore in, we can be very hopeful that in 2021 that we will have at least one if not more candidates which are shown to be safe and effective. And, and you remember that it's not enough to show safe and effective, then you have to manufacture hundreds of millions of doses. 
So the other thing that WHO is working on is this um, developing a allocation framework because we don't want to be in a situation where there are some doses of vaccine but uh, that they're not available to everyone, that they're just available to a few people in a few countries. So this is where the global solidarity comes in and, and our member states are discussing, you know, how do we make a fair and equitable allocation so that let's say you have 50 million doses to begin with, you know, who are the people who need it the most? It shouldn't be limited to, by country, but it should be, is it the most vulnerable, the frontline workers that we see are getting infected? Is it the elderly, people above 60 or 65? We need to have a consensus on that so that we agree to share the virus, uh, the vaccine that's available. The virus has been shared by all around the world. So now we need to share the vaccine also in a way that we protect the most vulnerable. And as we go into 2021, 22, we'll have hundreds of millions and many companies are saying they will manufacture billions of doses. Then it becomes easier to distribute it more fairly. WHO as well launched an initiative to uh, work with countries and partners to ensure access to vaccine once it's developed, right? Yes. Uh, could you tell us more what, what we, how we are doing and collaborating with countries in, in, this, in this initiative? So there are two initiatives which are linked but a little different. One, uh, what we call the COVID technology access platform, which is an initiative that was launched by the Director General and the President of Costa Rica and about 35 other heads of state about two weeks ago to basically ask countries and research funders and companies to deposit their technology into this access uh, pool, which means that you then make it available to the public as a public good. And, and some people have described, for example, a people's vaccine, which means you develop it, but then you donate uh, the technology, you donate the uh, intellectual property so that everyone can use it, many companies can use it. The other initiative that we're very, uh, we're leading and we're working really hard on is called the ACT Accelerator. So that's the, uh, it's ACT stands for Access to COVID Technologies again, Accelerator. It's basically how do we bring everyone together, private sector, public sector, funders, multilateral agencies, the UN and scientists, to develop these tools, diagnostics, drugs, and vaccines for COVID and do it in an accelerated time frame as soon as possible. And it starts with access. So it's not just about the research and the development, but it's how do you get access to people? How do you make sure that we can deploy it in all countries? So that accelerator is, uh, is, is really a wonderful way of all partners coming together to see how do we do this. And a part of that is, is, is also how you invest in these, uh, in these uh, tools. You, you do public pooling, you do risk pooling. So if all countries invest in, in a whole range of vaccines, then there's a better chance for every country to have a winning candidate. It's like a race. If you bet on one horse and that horse doesn't win, then you're left with nothing. But if you're able to pool your resources and bet on six horses. One of those six has a much better chance of winning. And this is where I think the public needs to understand, politicians, countries need to really come together and say, how do we, this is a global problem. So it has to be a global solution. And in this case, a national solution will not work for very long. Thank you, Dr. Sumia. We are receiving some very interesting questions. And here is the first one from Carolyn Rayleigh. Uh, saying New Zealand don't, uh, doesn't have any more cases of infection, I believe. So why are you still thinking the rest of the world needs a vaccination? That's an excellent question. And I think New Zealand and a few other countries have been able to show that by applying the um, standard and well-tested public health measures that they've actually been able to um, cut the transmission down to practically zero. And as I said, there are other countries who've who've shown this is possible. Um, there's Vietnam, there's uh, South Korea, there's Germany, there's Taiwan. There are countries and, re and areas that have shown that this is possible within larger countries also. Some areas have shown it's possible, but many places are struggling. And so I think the, um, while this question raises the important point that what do we have now? We have diagnostics, we know how to do contact tracing, we know how to do syndromic surveillance, identify people who have the symptoms, to be able to isolate them. We need to find their contacts and quarantine them. And the public needs to follow 
the, the things that have been shown to work, maintaining physical distance, wearing a mask when you go out, have it covering your face and, and ensuring that you're uh, doing your hand washing and respiratory etiquette, not coughing and sneezing in public, staying home if you're sick. If everyone followed all of this, I think we could bring down infection rates in many countries. But I think in the long term, New Zealand opens up its borders, it will have infection coming in because it's spread all over the world now and people cannot remain in isolation and therefore you need a vaccine so that people, we can go back uh, and, and, and start the economies up again as quickly as possible. Thank you, Dr. Sumia. Here is another question related to vaccine development and our viewer is saying that uh, my country has started um, for a clinical test phase one. The vaccine is important from another country. What do you think about that? Can it work? Because we know the strain from every country is different. The mutation of COVID-19 is very high. That's another excellent question. Luckily for us, the mutations that have been uh, observed and all viruses mutate, they change. So that's expected. But the mutations have not been shown to be in those regions of the virus, the spike protein, the receptor binding domain that are going to alter the efficacy of a vaccine so far. So viruses keep on changing and we have to keep an eye on that. But the other in interesting point that this question has raised is, is it okay to do a vaccine trial in one country and then have it applicable to all countries? Based on the science now, yes, we think so because the virus may be slightly different, but it's not so different that um, the vaccine will not work. But it's also good to have vaccine trials in many different countries because you have different populations, different genetics, different risk factors. And so it, it is a good, and WHO would very much like to see the candidates that are being developed now, being tested in many countries, like, uh, you know, we're doing the solidarity trial for, for medicines. The other advantage of that is that uh, we have seen this epidemic up and down in different parts of the world, right? So you have a Europe wave that subsides and you have the North American wave, you have a Latin American, a South Asian. So if you have trials happening in different parts of the world, it's much more likely that you will have uh, places where there's still active transmission of the infection going on. So you can answer the questions, you can finish the trials faster if you are uh, set up in different parts of the world, because if you're doing it in one country and the infection is controlled, like we mentioned uh, New Zealand, but also China, for example, you won't have enough uh, infection. So the trial will not be able to be successful because you can't compare the two groups that we talked about earlier. So that's another reason. And I think it's a very good point that's been brought up to have these global trials. Thank you, Dr. Sumia. Here's another question. You touched base the, uh, on that already, but maybe to, to explain um, uh, more. How will, from, the question is coming from LinkedIn, and thank you. How will the vaccine be tailored for the population where a lar large range of biological factors might interfere with the effectiveness of the vaccine between individuals? Uh, for example, different health conditions, age, different lifestyles, environment exposure. Yes, excellent questions. Um, so this is why you need these phase three trials, which are large. I said they're you know, usually in tens of thousands of people so that you get a mix of, uh, of all of uh, these uh, factors you mentioned, you know, age, sex, uh, other diseases, conditions. Age is extremely important huh? because old age and young uh, have different immune responses. Uh, the elderly don't respond as well to certain kinds of vaccines. And you know, for this um, COVID, we have a range of different vaccine platforms. So there are some which are traditionally being used in many different vaccines. Like we know that inactivated viruses, where you kill a whole virus and use it as a, as a very old uh, method of, uh, of uh, vaccination. Then you have um, uh, whole but um, attenuated viruses. They're still living, but they have less virulence. Then you have protein. You just take a part of the viral protein and you use that with an adjuvant. But now we have new platforms, which are DNA and RNA viruses which have never been used in people before. They've been developed for other diseases, but never used on a wider scale. So here there's a, it's exciting because you have the advantages of some platforms which can be manufactured in large amounts and used like the RNA vaccines. But on the other hand, we don't know how it will actually turn out when we test. So, so it's exactly to have this kind of information in different populations, different risk groups, different age groups, male, female, et cetera, that we need to do these large 
phase three trials, and these are, it's a big undertaking. It's not, it's not very simple. And here again, that's why we need collaboration. We need countries to come forward to take part in trials. You need companies to come forward and say, we offer our vaccine for testing in many places. And you need well-trained teams. And you also need the local communities uh, to be uh, engaged and understand. So it's all of you. It's the communities that should ask questions, that should participate in the decision making. And every country that wants to do clinical trials this is the time to start doing those uh, preparations, having those dialogues with people who will eventually be the volunteers, with the regulatory agencies in the countries, with the ethics committees, with the doctors who are going to be leading these trials. So we need all of this to happen now before we start having these big trials in the second half of this year. Thank you, Dr. Sumia. Here's the next question coming from Sailor Pastola. What technological research are going on for faster and more accurate virus detection? That's again, a, it's an excellent point. And um, as everyone knows, right now for the virus detection, you need to take a, a specimen from the respiratory tract through a, through a nasopharyngeal swab, or, and then you need to take it away to the lab uh, in a medium, and then you extract the RNA of the virus and then you detect it. It needs a pretty sophisticated lab uh, environment and trained people and machines. What we would like is a diagnostic test that could be rapid, easy to do, any health worker can do it, low risk, so that you're not uh, coughing and things like that onto the person and you can get the result in half an hour. So what we call a rapid detection test. We have this for other diseases, like other respiratory infections, even for influenza, there's a rapid test. You go to the doctor, they take a swab, you wait, half an hour later you have um, a test. For streptococcal sore throat, we have the same thing. That's what we need where scientists are working on a rapid antigen test, which could be used on a respiratory, uh, and if it can be self done by person at home, that would be even easier, because then you don't go into a health, uh, center and you know expose yourself or expose others so that's uh, one area of work and uh, we don't have one yet but hopefully we will the other one is can we use a saliva or can we use an oral swab you know instead of uh, putting the swab to the back of the throat so again people could do it themselves and drop it off at a testing center and then in the test center itself there are innovations like pooled testing if you have a shortage of kits and you want to test more people in the community, you could pool five or 10 samples and then do the PCR test. And if it's positive, then you have to test individual samples. But if it's negative, you know all those 10 people were negative. So you've actually saved on, um, uh, on, on many kits because we know that shortage of kits in many countries is uh, affecting how many tests uh, they can do. But so diagnostics is an extremely important area of research. Thank you, Dr. Sumia. Um, Let's talk a little bit about treatment. Uh, we know that at the moment there is no treatment for COVID-19, but WHO launched an international solidarity trial to help um, finding an effective treatment. So how does this trial work? So before I talk about the trial, let me just say that while there's no specific treatment uh, for the virus, we know what we have to do to, to treat people. And again, you see countries who've done it well have very low case fatality rates. So it's not, uh, we don't need to give up that we don't have a treatment. What we need to do is to diagnose people early, which means again, you have to do more of uh, case finding. You have to go out in the community and test people. Everyone has symptoms. Finding people early and keeping them under observation is a very good way of reducing mortality because then you know how they're progressing and if there's any sign that their oxygen levels are dropping or that they are becoming breathless, you know they need medical care. Oxygen is extremely important. So all health facilities that look after COVID patients must ensure that there's oxygen. There's a lot we've learned about the nursing of these people and how to look after them, when to use ventilation, when not to use ventilation, what are the other supportive drugs that seem to be helping. So there's all this clinical management, which again, we're putting out uh, guidelines on and updating them. But then of course, we would like to have a drug that works specifically against this virus Antiviral drug discovery is, uh, again, a, not a very easy task. So what we started off by doing, what scientists started off by doing, is looking at existing drugs, which are already used for other diseases, and then seeing if we can repurpose them. 
So quickly do lab tests to see whether the existing drugs are active against this virus in the lab and then take those into phase three clinical trials because you have already established the safety of that drug in for some other disease. It's being used in human beings. So it's called repurposing. So the solidarity trial that the WHO started and many other trials around the world were basically testing these other drugs. So we've got in our trial, we've got lopinavir ritonavir, which is used for HIV treatment. We've got hydroxychloroquine, which of course is used for malaria, but also for other autoimmune diseases. We've got a drug called interferon. Um, interferons are uh, also used as, um, as stimulants of the immune system. They've been used against MERS, another coronavirus, for example. Then we've got remdesivir. This is um, a, a drug that's not been widely used. It was developed and tested for Ebola, and uh, it was shown to have antiviral effect against SARS-CoV-2. So these are the four drugs that we are testing within the solidarity trial, and other trials are also using the, the same drugs. And uh, the idea was, again, to do it in a large number of patients around the world and to use this drug, uh, these drugs against a standard of care, which is your control uh, against which you will compare. And uh, currently, we have about 4,000 patients enrolled in about uh, 18 countries uh, in over 450 hospitals. So this is a huge collaboration across the world. Every, every continent is involved, um, in Latin America, uh, in, uh, in Africa, in Asia, in, um, in the Middle East, in Europe. And so we will have, ultimately, uh, hopefully good answers on whether these work or don't work. Uh, now, because these are repurposed drugs, they were not specifically developed for this virus, there's a chance that they may not work, but it's worth testing them and trying them. And meanwhile, of course, scientists are coming up with more, um, we're keeping an eye, so we keep on updating our landscape document to see what's new. And the next um, set of drugs which go into solidarity may be monoclonal antibodies, it could be other drugs that people are finding are effective. So we've established the platform now, and all of these doctors across the world are, are excited and wanting to continue this uh, type of exercise. So once we finish testing one lot of uh, drugs, we can take another set. Uh, Dr. Sumia, how can countries join the trial? And uh, can individuals volunteer to be part of a trial if their country is, is part of it as well? So the way it works is that WHO, um, of course, put out a call and we received, uh, in fact, over 100 countries, we received expressions of interest. So what we do is then we follow up with the Ministry of Health. We have to sign an agreement that we work together and, and, and the Ministry of Health must agree to co-sponsor the trial. Then they actually appoint a one uh, leading doctor in the country to be the coordinator. And that person, that doctor then identifies the hospitals where COVID patients are being admitted. They have to go through the ethics approval and the regulatory approval from the country. Then we ship the drugs and then they, they start enrolling patients. Now patients, uh, if they volunteer, want to volunteer, first of all, they have to of course have the disease and fulfill the criteria, but then they also have to be admitted in one of the hospitals that's participating in the, in the uh, solidarity trial uh, to be eligible. So it's up to the countries and, uh, and the person that they appoint really to, to do the local organization. We have uh, telephone calls every week with uh, the, the, the main principal investigators from all the countries to update them, to hear from them. Uh, uh, so we're all the time sharing information and also to think about the future of the trial. You know, If one question has been answered, then we should settle that and move on to answering the next question. That's the most efficient way of, of telling people this drug does not seem to work. Let's move on now to testing the next drug. And, um, and so that's how we do it. So individuals can't volunteer directly, but it's really through the network of hospitals in the country that it's done. Thank you, Dr. Sumia. Um, here's one comment coming from LinkedIn. Um, we might have another pandemic in future requiring another vaccine. What can be done in future to expedite the process of launching a vaccine to the population? This is a great question. And you know, after the West Africa Ebola outbreak, in fact, this uh, came up because there was nothing. The world um, had some Ebola candidates which were sitting in scientist labs, but it had not been developed to the point where it could quickly be deployed. And we could have saved, I think, many thousands of lives if that had been the case. So after that, 
in 2016, the WHO developed what we call the R&D blueprint to identify those diseases, those organisms, mostly viruses, that can cause pandemics, that can cause large epidemics, that need diagnostics, vaccines, and drugs to be developed. And these are all neglected diseases. So once that uh, R&D blueprint came up with a list of about nine um, uh, pathogens, uh, viruses mainly, and also something called disease X. This was very interesting because even at that time, people uh, had exactly this idea that we could have some unknown um, virus coming in and we called it uh, disease X or pathogen X. How do you prepare for that? So there was an organization launched called CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic uh, Preparedness Innovations, which was basically set up to exactly do this, develop vaccines for diseases which could cause epidemics and pandemics. And they started working on, uh, on infections like MERS, like uh, Nipah, like the Lassa fever, which causes recurrent outbreaks in West Africa, um, and some other hemorrhagic uh, fevers. Uh, also chikungunya, which causes large outbreaks. It doesn't kill that many people, but it causes a lot of morbidity. And then this pathogen X was the one for which you have to prepare. And how do you prepare? you prepare vaccine platforms on which you can then impose any antigen. So if you have the platform ready, you have a new virus, as soon as it's sequenced, you can take the parts of the virus you want and put it on the platform and quickly start making vaccine. And that's exactly what happened. There were RNA and DNA platforms that were set up so that as soon as the sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 was available on January 11th, it was plugged in and you had a, a vaccine candidate that some companies were able to develop. So that's how you prepare for the next pandemic. But uh, you know, apart from the vaccines and the diagnostics, health systems also need to prepare. And this is where, again, we've fallen short. We've seen that in country after country after country that the public health system could not cope, that we could not track. We did not know where the virus was. How is it spreading? We didn't have the mechanism to do contact tracing to be able to quarantine people and so on. So there's also that aspect that you need to develop a public health system and a workforce and a, and a platform and a governance mechanism and trained people in place to respond quickly. So there's the technology side and the innovation, but there's also the very basic preparations that is what we call boots on the ground. You need people on the ground to do some of this work. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumia. We are uh, running out of time, but we are receiving a lot of questions. And I see that, again, there are a lot of uh, those coming about vaccine candidates. Uh, where are we with the vaccine development? And do we have capacities to deliver vaccine once it's ready on a global scale? So, yes. To if go we can just summarize once again <laughs> before we close, sorry. So, huge activity in vaccine development. Um, at least 100 candidates, you know, that are in advanced preclinical, you know, 200 if you take the whole list, about 10 or 11 in, in human uh, clinical testing. So within the next 6 to 12 months, we're going to start seeing results from some of the, the trials. So that's the first step. We start seeing results. We come get to know whether a vaccine is actually effective and safe. The manufacturing, there's investment right now going into manufacturing capacity uh, spread out or in all over the world um, so that as soon as um, or even before you know whether the vaccine is effective the, the, there's already production of that vaccine happening so that it can be very quickly sent out uh, to countries and then uh, a very important uh, area which again we are addressing is getting countries ready to do this so countries need to start planning okay if i have a 10 million doses or 20 million doses coming in by December, who am I going to vaccinate? How am I going to do that? How am I going to communicate this to people and be ready? Because you know, to vaccinate people, you need also needles, syringes, you need uh, cold chains, you need um, all sorts of other things to be put in place. It's not just a question of the vaccine arriving and then you'll be able to give it. So we may run into shortages of all of those. So we're also looking into glass vials, into needles and syringes, making sure that those are also being manufactured in enough, uh, enough volumes. So I think this is going to be a very uh, hot topic for, uh, for many months to come, and perhaps we should uh, touch base frequently 
you know, with our viewers uh, and, and maybe even go into more details into which vaccines are being tested and the results uh, that are coming out and, and what does it mean? Because one thing I just want to say in closing, um, Alex, is I think for the first time we've had this huge public interest and focus on what's happening in the science. Normally, you know, science goes on quietly behind the scenes and the public gets to know when there's a result, when something happens, you get to hear of it. But here, every step, every step. And so sometimes that can also get confusing because in science, you do studies to prove things. And then one study shows something and you say, ah, okay, you found this. Another study then shows uh, something slightly different or brings up a new um, uh, aspect of that. Then you have to change. And so change is part of science. It doesn't mean that uh, what you said three months ago was wrong and that, and that you said something wrong. It was the state of knowledge at that time. And the state of knowledge is evolving so rapidly that very frankly, uh, Alex, it's hard to keep up. It's really hard to keep up. You know we, how many publications a day on, on COVID? Just guess. It's an average of 500 publications a day. And so for someone to be able to read and understand and, and also differentiate, there's low quality stuff coming out as well as high quality science. You have to be able to tell the difference. So we have a whole army of people here working in the science division on screening all of that, which is coming out, taking out the key ones, then synthesizing it, and then you know forming uh, an opinion. And so I hope that people will understand that uh, as science evolves, we keep on trying to be up to date and change our guidance and so on, but sometimes it's difficult because either there is no clear consensus, it's an evolving field, and we have to also uh, keep up with that, um, and, and it's a big responsibility uh, to do that. Thank you, so. Dr. Sumia, and thank you for clarifying this as well, that science is evolving and we are learning every day, and we learned a lot in past months, um, uh, and working with scientists around the world to to create and update our guidance. And bringing to guidance, uh, recently we updated our guidance on masks and viewers are asking why are we not wearing masks so could you maybe respond to that yes of course we, we should be the ones definitely following our guidance and we do we absolutely do you if you see the the way that we are set up now it's very very different than we were set up uh, before January so we have more than definitely more than uh, three feet between us and we make sure that all our meeting rooms and everything that that distance is maintained and uh, and so what we know the, from the way that the infection is spread is that uh, if you are in close proximity within three feet then you are likely to uh, have the droplets uh, come out and uh, and perhaps even land on the other person so we have to be careful we're also washing our hands and and sterilizing uh, using disinfect uh, using the uh, alcohol based uh, skin disinfectants quite uh, often we have very few people uh, coming in and every morning we each fill out a form to say whether we are feeling uh, fine or whether we have any symptoms which means that we must stay at home and so we follow uh, all of that and when we go out into a crowded place where we cannot maintain physical distance uh, like you go into a grocery store then we wear we wear masks Thank you, Dr. Sumia. Thank you so much for your time and for responding uh, questions to our viewers. I also would like to remind you that three times a week, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, 5 p.m. Geneva time, um, our Director General and our experts, including Dr. Sumia, are there responding journalist questions. So you can follow and watch for updates also on, on our work on, on science. Um, as well, you can follow our uh, social media channels where we also provide updates regularly or visit our website www.who.int. And thank you all for watching us from Angola, Chad, India, Ghana, Namibia, Jordan, Uganda, Australia, Italy, Palestine, Albania, Iran, France, Sudan, Nigeria, UK, Bangladesh, and many more. It's really, the list is very long. Thank you for your interest and for following WHO. Uh, we will be back soon. Until then, goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.